so yeah, my, my name is Cecil Roulette. Uh, I currently live in Rivers, Manitoba. Uh, that's where my wife is from. Her family's from Rivers, Manitoba. So uh, we have three kids. I've got a, a daughter that's 18. She just uh, She's just graduating from uh, health grade from uh, ACC. Uh, I have a 16-year-old boy uh, who's really into hockey. Uh, he was just drafted uh, a couple years ago by um, the Red Deer Rebels. So he's gone to a camp last year and he's got to go to another camp this year to see if he can make the team. Um, he was also drafted by uh, Weiwei Sakapo in the MJ. So he's probably going to be leaving us uh, this year. So uh, we kind of downsized our house. we got a smaller house. And uh, so now we're going to probably only have our youngest who's uh, 13. And, uh, and she plays hockey and volleyball. And, uh, so they keep us quite busy. Um, so when I first uh, decided to go back to school, you know, it, it, um, I was getting tired of working at, uh, at restaurants and gas stations and things like that and lumber yards. So I thought I got to go back to school if I want to do what I want to do. So, and I've always wanted to help people. Um, I know my dad discouraged me from that. He goes, you know, you shouldn't be looking into that because you're going to get shot. He said, because that's, you know, back in his day, I guess that, that was kind of something, you know, that people didn't like the people that were helping uh, in those services. So, so, uh, but I still wanted to do it. I said, you know, I want to, I want to make a change. So I ended up going to uh, Stenner Boyne Community College and I took a course there. It was called uh, Community Social Development Worker. And like I found out right away that uh, my reading and my writing wasn't up to par. It wasn't up to uh, college level uh and I needed to work on that. So what ended up happening is, you know, I just kind of barely squeaked by on that. And it was, it was tough because it would take me an hour to read 10 pages because my vocabulary wasn't there yet. I, you know, I had to look, uh, read something, find out there was a hit a word that I didn't know what it meant to have to look in the dictionary, read it, go back, read that again to understand it. So it would take me quite a while to, to read things. And then, um, so then I decided, well, I got to get some upgrading. So I went uh, uh, back to the adult collegiate and I uh, did my 11 and 12 again. And uh, did fairly good there. Um, and after uh, I, did, I did that in one year, uh, then um, I ended up going back to ACC again. And I, just as I was finishing that upgrading, uh, they changed the program to a two-year program. And because I took the first year, they let me take the second year. Right away, so I went to that. Uh, took that course. By now, it was called Aboriginal Community Development, uh, and that was a one-year, uh, second uh, year. And it was uh, I only had to do that for one year. Uh, then, after completing that, um, that's when I got. Uh, I was wondering, well, what am I going to do? And then, um, then um, First Nations Aboriginal Counseling degree started at uh, Brandon University the, the next year. So. And while I was doing this, I was working at the Y, you know, I was working with child and family services as a in-home worker. So I'd go and it's kind of like respite. Um, so I was doing that while I was uh, going to school. And then um, uh, that the, the diploma pro program at uh, BU uh, came up. And so I decided, and I could transfer some of my credits over. So I, I decided to take that. And, you know, for me, doing all the schooling after grade 12, like I didn't have, I wasn't very good at school. Um, I had a tough time uh, understanding things, like when it was written or if I had to write things, it was hard for me to do it. And it's still hard for me to write things. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I really love spell check and I love, you know, autocorrect because <laughs> it helps me out quite a bit now. But um, I still have a difficult time uh, uh, writing things down or, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of you know, holding the information in. So for me, it, it, the schooling part was tough and I didn't want to do it, but I knew I had to do it to get to where I wanted to get uh, to be. And then as I was finishing up the, the program at uh, BU, I um, you know, I met one of my friends at Walmart and she was working at the, the college at the time. 
And she was asking me what I was doing. I said, oh, I'm finishing up school. You know, I told her all about my, my program and all the stuff that I was taking. And she goes, you know what? You're perfect for a job that's coming up at uh, ACC. So, and that position uh, was, uh, it was first called Aboriginal Counselor, uh, Cultural Consultant. So uh, I applied for that job. Uh, so this is my first big interview. Like I, I didn't know uh, much about interviews and I didn't know that, you know, because usually it was just handing your resume and you talk to the boss, he says yes or no. But uh, when you get into bigger jobs, you know, there's handing in your resume, they call you back, uh, you might have to do an assignment. So I did an assignment um, and then they call you in for an interview. Uh, so, and the interviews aren't just, uh, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, this was a three hour interview. And so it was something that, um, I, I wasn't prepared. Well, I was prepared for it because I talked to some of my friends that were, you know, in university and one of my best friends, uh, Kevin Grindy, his, uh, him and his father helped me with getting prepared for the interview because his dad did a lot of interviews for, for courts and court judges and stuff like that. So he said, I'll help you out. And he said, what kind of job interview is this? And I said, it's a situational uh, interview. So we just went over scenarios on, you know, what I would uh, uh, describe on how I'd, uh, you know, what I would do with the students, how I'd help the students. And it, um, I think it came down to two of, two, two of us. Um, and, um, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of experience with adults, but I had a lot of experience with uh, young kids, you know, so that kind of, they didn't um, recognize that as something that would help them help me with um, adults. But uh, so there was, I think there was uh, um, two people on the hiring committee that really wanted me. And uh, the, the other guy that I was uh, going up against, um, he was uh, actually one of the, my classmates at university. So, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, hard to see him not get it but I was happy that I got it. Um, and it was, um, it was a three-year term uh, and it was funded by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. And the Aboriginal Healing Foundation uh, came out of, uh, of all, uh, you know, all, the, all the problems that uh, residential school survivors have had. So this Healing Foundation was uh, uh, created by the government to help uh, alleviate some of that uh, um, pain and uh, and help uh, help our students uh, be successful at college, and you know I've been here for 21 years now, and it, it's still there's still that um, that hurt and pain is still there, and our students are still struggling with that those effects from residential school. So we you know we're we, we still still work as hard as we can uh, to try to. Uh, make them uh, successful here. But again, you know, sometimes their mindset isn't uh, on being successful. It's on, it's on hurt, trauma, and, uh, and the stigma of not being, um, um, what you say, uh, valued. You know, they, they don't see, they don't, uh, they don't see the value of them finishing uh, the, the school. And I don't think they think anybody else would see the value of them finishing the school. So, so I'm trying to get that mindset changed to where they, you know, um, you know, they can do it and they can be successful at it. For me, it was uh, watching my mom go to school. When my mom went to uh, school in uh, Mendoza for healthcare aid, and watching her drive back and forth all winter, and then uh, her graduating and getting her job. Um, that's what kind of inspired me to go. I was like, my mom could do it, I could do it. So that, that kind of gave me the, the strength to do it. Not, not saying that it wasn't hard, you know, I still had my, uh, my demons, my things that I was dealing with. Um, and you know, um, it's funny because when you change your, your lifestyle and you change uh, some of your habits, your bad habits, sometimes you become uh, very lonely. Uh, sometimes, you know, your friends that you had, uh, they're not good for you. They're toxic, so you have to get new friends. And then that took time. 
So I think there was for maybe about a year, I think I was really lonely um, because, you know, I was changing my way of living and uh, some of my friends uh, didn't fit into that the way I wanted to live. So, um, and you know, culture has really helped me out quite a bit. Um, it's uh, given me a sense of pride in myself. You know, I didn't feel like when I was in Nipua, I didn't feel very proud to be an indigenous person. Um, I think there was a lot of shame there. Um, I never had my hair long. You know, I never grew it long and have a nice braid. Um, and you can see my hair is, is, is getting quite long right now. And the reason I'm growing my hair is because um, when they found those 215 kids in BC, those, you know, that was the first batch of kids they found that were buried in unmarked graves on residential school sites. And when I heard that, that uh, hit me pretty hard. It, um, you know, um, I felt that in my heart quite a bit because I thought about those kids and I thought about, you know, my grandparents, uh, my parents, you know, and I thought about my kids, you know, that could have been them, right? So I thought to myself, well, what, what can I do? So while I was sitting there, I thought, you know, they, they never had a chance to grow their hair long, or if they did have a chance, you know, they did have long hair and it was cut, right? So. So that's why I'm growing my hair now is for them. And it's funny because um, everybody knows that I always have my, my hair cut short, right? So now they ask me questions like, oh, your hair's looking good. See, so you know, why, why, why are you growing it long? And then I explain to them why I'm growing it long. So then it starts that conversation. And, um, and what I'm trying to do is, you know, just trying to let people know that this happened, you know, the residential school happened and it's, not something that was, uh, you know, um, very positive for Indigenous people. Um, and, you know, and that's what, the, you know, that's what I'm trying to do with uh, working with students at the college is trying to instill some pride in them to, to see that, uh, you know, they can do it and they can be successful. Um, you know, my one goal right now is just trying to trying to get students to start their own businesses now. So, you know, I, I want them to start only businesses. I want them to start, uh, um, you know, having uh, providing jobs for uh, indigenous people. You know, all people, but mostly indigenous. You know. But that that's that's my main goal right now, and that's you know where I'm kind of at right now is, and I feel comfortable um, now being an indigenous person. Uh, I even told my brothers and sisters that, you know, um, you know, me not having uh, long hair was it because of uh, because of shame. You know, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to be different from everybody else. But now I know that uh, our hair, our hair has a uh, very important stuff spiritually. So, so having my hair long, and um, I don't know how long I'm going to keep it. You know, um, I've given myself four years, and the reason I give myself four years is because the the number four is important to us. It's a very sacred number to us. It's a cycle of um, uh, of a year. It's a cycle of a person's life. Uh, it's the four seasons. Uh, so I said I'll give myself four years. Let my hair grow for four years. And then um, I'll see where I'll go from there. Uh, because I believe in spirit. I believe in um, uh, the creator. I believe that, you know, they, they guide us. Uh, and by, I think by the time that four, year, four years comes up, you know, I'll have a sign that if I need to cut it or if I, you know, keep it. Um, does anybody have any questions? I know I, I know I kind of dumped some heavy stuff on you with residential schools. <laughs> well, Cecil, it's in Iran here. I'm, I'm great for a lightning mood, I hope. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're right. This is some pretty heavy stuff. I see a guitar behind you. What yeah. is that? Are you a musician as well? Pardon me? Are you a musician as well? 
<laughs> not not a very good one. Like I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I, I hear a little riff that I like and then I'll try to learn that. And then that's all I want to play is that. Uh, but, but the reason I have the guitar here is, uh, is because it's one of the tools I use with my, uh, my students that I'm helping out. You know, sometimes a person just needs to come and uh, kind of take some time to themselves and relax. And sometimes the guitar does that. Um, sometimes just coming to my office and talking, chat for a bit. Um, we do a smudge too. Like uh, um, we have uh, four medicines that uh, we use to help keep us uh, strong. Um, so we've got uh, sweet grass, got cedar, we got sage, and we got tobacco. So those are our four medicines that we use to, to keep ourselves uh, well-rounded. So the sage, we use sage quite a bit here, uh, and we burn it and we use the smoke to kind of take away negative feelings. Uh, if a person's feeling stressed or, you know, um, worried, uh, we'll let them smudge with sage. So then that's just burning the sage and then bringing the, the smoke up to your eyes so you see good things, bringing the smoke up to your mouth so when you speak, good words come out. Uh, bringing the smoke to your ears so when you're hear, listening to people, you hear good, um, hear them in a good way. Uh, you, you smudge your head with the smoke so that your thoughts and your, um, you, you're just organized with your thoughts and you have good thoughts. And then you smudge your heart so that you have good feelings for the rest of the day. So that, uh, you know, kind of helps our students out too. Some of them will come and do that before an exam just to get themselves focused because they're so worried about the, the, the exam, uh, they tend to forget what they've studied, right? So when they come in and they smudge, it kind of focuses them on, on that exam and then their thoughts get organized again, right? And then they're able to, to take that test with a little less stress. Because that, that uh, spiritually takes away the stress. And I always tell people, like, you know, if you ever go into a room and, you, and there's a couple of people fighting, you can feel that energy, that, that energy of the, the two people fighting, and you can feel that energy. And that's the energy we try to get rid of with the, with the sage, rid of that. More questions? Were, were there any more questions? Oh, I think a lot. Okay, okay. Um, can you hear me or should I get Ron to relay this? I'll, I'll relay it. Okay. Um, have your struggles with schooling helped you relate to the students you're working with now? Definitely, definitely. Um, uh, I have a better understanding of um, what it's taking them to, to, um, to be successful and the amount of time that they're going to be spending at doing their studies after after uh, classes are done. Because um, I always tell them that, you know, I always tell them that, you know, it takes me, it used to take me an hour to read 10 pages. I said I could read 20 pages, but I wouldn't retain any of that, eh? So I told I tell them about the, using the dictionary and, um, you know, I tell them about uh, how much time you're gonna have to spend after class. You know, you're gonna spend you know, at least an hour on each program that you take um to kind of do your homework so if they're taking you know five six courses you know that's five six hours after school they're gonna have to to um to put in so they have no time to work they have no time to uh have any um recreational um activities until they they finish their exams once they, I, always, I always tell them once you finish your exams and you're, you're done all your your projects and your papers you know, then that's the time to celebrate and take a little break and have some time for yourself, recuperate, and then get ready for the next term. Um, you know, I talk about housing, I talk about, uh, you know, um, budgeting, I talk about, you know, because when you're going to school, you're not, you're not a rich person. Um, and a lot of times when you're, when you do go to school, uh, sometimes your friends and your families think because you're, you're maybe you're sponsored, and you're, you're getting a, a living allowance that you have lots of money, right? So, but you don't, you don't, you just have enough for your bills and maybe have 50 bucks to put in your pocket to, you know, go get a Slurpee or something like that. Um, and that, that's got to last you for two weeks, right? So 
so sometimes you know oh, I see somebody walking in. <laughs> but yeah, I can I can definitely uh, relate to students and, and uh, kind of pass on that information. Yeah. I really appreciate you taking time and sharing what you shared. I just remember seeing these nice kids who I knew were indigenous, only we didn't even use that word on a year ago. And just so you know, just so you know, I checked with our boys. I checked with our sons. And they say, oh yeah, I, I, re I remember Cecil. I remember Cecil. And this is what Rob had to say. Rob said, yeah, he was a year ahead of me. Very kind and always got the sense that he was one smart dude. That's from a contemporary who remembers you from all those years ago. So thank you, Miigwech, 